I'm looking around this room and I'm in some awe and, and feeling quite humble. I, there, I really doubt if there's ever been so many journalists with a deep and ongoing commitment to Cuba and facets, the many facets of Cuban history, society, culture, American policy and relations between the two countries um, in the same room. I, if I do the math, I think there's something between 600 and 1,000 years of experience in covering Cuba in this room, which is a lot to think about, uh, and a lot of devotion to a, a critical story. And uh, similarly, the convocation of really world-class scholars, many of whom are here now, some of whom will join us later, uh, policy leaders and thinkers on Cuba, it's a remarkable thing and um, a privilege to be part of this conversation. Um, 52 years ago this week, uh, the US and, the Cu and Cuba and the Soviet Union faced off in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I suspect that we'll hear a little bit about that during the day. Um, I am not an expert on Cuba, but I do know what it's like as a journalist to feel stuck in a story, stuck in a narrative. Uh, know what it's like even as you report on change, tr report on um, shifting sands of history, to feel your editors, your listeners, your viewers, your readers, and even the leaders you are writing about stuck in the same narrative. It's really striking how much we as citizens have been caught in a single polarized narrative about Cuba and the United States, even as you in this room have tried to push and pull and shift that storyline. Um, it's, we've had a society, two societies really, captive to a half century old narrative and the limits of perception, the limits of political change, the limits of policy change that result. I think we are all here because we share a sense that at long last, that narrative may be coming unstuck. And you in this room are a big part of unsticking that narrative. Um, you who are reporters in this room and the scholars and experts and policy leaders who are here have already tried to enlighten the world and understand a bit about generational change in Cuba, generational change in the diaspora, generational and historical change in US pol politics and policy, uh, in a global economy, a new international human rights climate very different from 50 years ago. We uh, in this room share a sense that at, at long last, these varying shifts and forces are coming together in a way that may change the narrative for good. Uh, for us as journalists, this is a complex moment. We need to be looking in a way that the press of deadlines rarely offers at new scholarship, new data, new leadership, new politics, cultural changes. We need to explore our own professions work, our own as individuals and also our own as journalists, looking back at what we did right, what we did wrong, and at lessons learned, and think in new ways about sources, about storylines, about priorities for news coverage in an era of change in Cuba, change in the US, and change perhaps uh, in the relations between them. Um, this three-day conference is designed to provoke a conversation, many conversations, within this room and beyond it, that begin here but continue after. Conversations, first and foremost, among the colleagues at the table here, conversations with, with the sources, with the experts and policy leaders and thoughtful people 
uh, who are assembled around the edges of the room and will be in and out through the day, um, and conversations with our uh, readers, our viewers, our listeners, our downloaders. That's what we do as journalists. journalists. So we've structured these three days in a way that I hope pushes that conversation forward. Today and tomorrow are primarily devoted to expert-driven panels and discussions. Um, we will be looking back historically, new uh, scholarship on the Cold War, new scholarship on secret diplomacy and other things. We'll be looking at the recent, uh, recent initiatives by the Obama administration, looking at issues of, of economy and culture and policy and all that stuff that's on your agenda. And then Saturday is structured much more as a journalist-to-journalist -journalist conversation in which we look both back and forward, look for lessons learned from past coverage and the prospects for where the story can go from here, what our role and responsibility as journalists will be, and how we can really do the job as well as we can. Um, mainly, uh, I'm going to get out of the way and, and let things happen. We are going to try to stick to schedule. A few ground rules. Um, on the one hand, this is, with one exception that I'll describe in a minute, an on-the-record conference. Uh, if there's a point at which any speaker wants to take us off the record, that's okay. But, um, you know, we are videotaping it, though not live streaming it. Um, what is said here should be understood as, as being on the record. Um, at the same time, we're trying to encourage a, a, a conversational atmosphere, a thoughtful atmosphere. Um, on the Columbia side of things, we will not be live tweeting, streaming, or doing any of that kind of contemporaneous reporting because we just really want the conversation to unfold and have people uh, have a sense of not being under constant scrutiny. How you choose to report or not, tweet or not, or whatever is your your business, but I would say that our primary goal here is to serve your long-term thinking rather than any kind of short-term news agenda. Um, the one exception to this is a, a Friday night's dinner. Uh, Dan Restrepo, most, not too long ago, left the Obama administration, um, has asked to speak off the record and said he would be much more interesting if that was the case. Uh, and since we may be at a moment of interesting, indeed, policy change coming out of Washington, we thought we'd honor his request and see where that goes. Um, so welcome again on behalf of Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. We're going to start this couple of days of expert conversations by looking not at Cuba, but the United States, how we look at that place. And no better guide, no better person to start it than Marjorie Connolly, who's uh, the editor of Special Polling at The Times. I'm going to not give big bios for everybody. They're in your program. That'll be true throughout the day to save time. Um, Marjorie, take it from here. Okay. Uh Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. I'm really happy to be here. Um, we have a very interesting panel uh, planned for our, uh, everyone here. It's the American public opinion and the politics of U.S. Cuban policy. You know, in, in anticipation of this conference, I can you hear me? Is this on? Okay. Better. Um, I did a search in the uh, polling archives. Uh, for questions on uh, Cuba and other than questions that had to do with Guantanamo in the last decade or so there haven't been very many uh, questions uh, from the major media polls you know there was a sort of flurry when the uh, travel restrictions were eased but other than you know including Cuba in a list of question uh, countries whether we have a favorable or not favorable opinion of them we don't ask about Cuba very much uh, lately. So um, luckily, our panelists have done recent in-depth polling and research on 
uh, what Americans think of the U.S. policy toward Cuba, and they will be uh, giving us some information on what they found out. Um, our first panelist is uh, Peter uh, Schechter, who is, uh, he mentioned he is the, um, the, from the Atlantic Council, he is the first director of the Adrian Arsh Latin American Center, and he's a former international consultant with more than 20 years of communications and political experience, mainly in Latin America. Uh, he's worked as a lead consultant on a number of um, uh, elections in Latin America, including Mexico and Colombia and Brazil. And he teaches at uh, George Washington University in, in Washington, D.C., and Ben Gurion uh, University in Israel. Um, I, I don't know, most of you probably saw that uh, editorial in the New York Times this weekend of, uh, that urged uh, President Obama to lift the um, embargo on Cuba. Well, it referenced a poll, which happened to be the Atlanta Council poll, and Peter will tell us more about that survey. So, Peter, thank Great. you. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to get up and click from here. That way I can So, um, well, thank you very much for inviting me, and I think it's great that, uh, that this conference is, is being held. Uh, Cuba has been the third rail of U.S. politics for so long. It's been the poison chalice of U.S. US electoral politics. Anybody who touched Cuba always got burned. It is, really has been a, this untouchable subject, and you can feel, as a number of people have already mentioned, you can feel how something is in the air and beginning to change. And so when Bruce referred to a half century of stuck narrative, um, I also want to refer to you to a similar half century of a monopoly of Cuba discussions that basically was controlled by two cities. Washington, D.C., and Miami. And um, we thought in a, this very new center that we had, and I, 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 I used to be a political consultant. My uh, experience and record as an intellectual is only one year long. So, um, you know, and I came, to, I came to the Atlantic Council with a view that, you know, you have to introduce politics as, as game changers, and one way, what I have seen over so many years is the power of polling to actually debunk myths. So one of the things that we did was we said, why don't we ask other people in the United States about what they think about normalization with Cuba? Why don't we ask other people in the United States whether this policy should change or whether we should keep it the same way? So this organization, which is quite an elite organization, John Huntsman, the um, former presidential candidate for the Republican Party, is our present chairman, Chuck Hagel, uh, now the Secretary of Defense, is our previous chairman, Brent Scowcroft. I mean, we're sort of an elite organization. And sort of doing polling was a little new for the Atlantic Council as well. But they were extremely supportive because everybody understands how stuck this issue has been. So with that, we, um, we um, well, I guess that in order to do polling, the one thing my colleagues and I decided was we better get, our, get ourselves two pollsters because it's not enough to do the first national poll on Cuba. We realized that we were going to be attacked. We realized that a lot of stuff that would come out of this poll would probably be quite controversial. So we hired two pollsters. And we hired Glenn Bolger, who is the Republican pollster. He's the speaker's pollster. Mm -hmm. He is, works for Public Opinion Strategies, probably the preeminent Republican polling company. And we hired Paul Maslin, who is a Democratic pollster who has numerous experience with both n national and statewide campaigns here in the United States. So um, as they say in Spanish, curarse en salud. Just in case, we hired two so that nobody could attack us for being on one side or the other, okay? So um, 
The methodology of this, we, we chose, a, again, in part because we really wanted to hammer home the importance of doing this as in, in as precise a way and as professional a way as possible. We did a pretty sizable sample uh, here. So we, we had a, a large sample, but not only that, we then oversampled a couple of places. We oversampled Florida for obvious reasons because of the large Cuban American community. We oversampled New Jersey because there, it's the second largest Cuban American community. It also happens to be the home of a very powerful uh, senator who has very, very, very um, important views on Cuba. And we oversampled Hispanics nationwide because we thought that it would be imp important to know what the nation's largest minority thought about this issue. So, um, so we, we, we feel that we, we came out with a sample that was sort of really quite, quite important and it, and, and it is, it comes out to about three plus or minus 3.1% in terms of margin of error. So the first thing we said was, a lot of people always say, oh, polling, you're asking the American people or you're asking the Bolivian people to decide things of policy. Look, I've done this for 24 years. I've done polling from the Philippine Islands to the Bolivian Highlands. And it's amazing what polling is and how right people are. And they get it instinctually. They may not be able to tell you the, the specifics of a policy debate, but people get it. And so when we ask people, tell us, rank countries with whom the Americans, with whom America has a good or bad relations, people ranked Cuba as worse than Iran. So you will see that, that the worst relation that America has is with Iran and Cuba, and, uh, the worst America, the relation that America has there is Cuba, and Iran is, 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 uh, is, is, is better. So we then went to what are the American attitudes towards Cuba itself. 56% of Americans favor changing our Cuba policy. When you add strongly, strongly favor and somewhat favor, 56%. When you ask this in the state of Florida, it's 63%. And when you ask it for Latinos, it's 62%, with opposing being 30%. This is, these are pretty big numbers in polling. We asked things in different ways. So we asked people, are you for normalizing relations with Cuba, or are you for engaging more directly with Cuba? We did this because it's really important in politics to make sure that the phraseology is correct and that we're talking to people in ways that they understand. So it's clear that when we talked about normalizing relations with Cuba, was a more comfortable position for Americans than in actually talking about engaging with, with Cuba. It's amazing here what you see because a lot of people talk about the fact that the reason that there is a skew in age, the people, people tend to think that older people are against normalizing relations with Cuba and younger people are for it. But here what you see there is that 65% of people from 65 and older are for normalizing relations with Cuba. If you look at this in terms of party lines, I mean, there, is very, there are very few issues in the United States in which parties are less polarized than this. I mean, there's only a very small difference between Democrats or people who lean Democratic and people who lean Republican here. There's an 8% difference between this. On almost any issue, as, my, as the two pollsters repeatedly said to audiences in Miami and in Los Angeles and in Washington, D.C., there's almost no issue in the United States that one can talk about that has only an 8% difference between Republicans and Democrats. As education increases, so does support for changing our policy to, to Cuba. So as you will see, is the, post, the postgraduate has 67%. Uh, the high, only high school graduates has, has 45%. 
Three quarters of Americans support changing U.S. policies so that we can coordinate with Cuba. So when people say, when you a, we ask people a number of ways, reasons that they so you can support changing policy with Cuba. So one of them was we should coordinate on issues of mutual importance, drugs, um, hurricane uh, cleanup, uh, environmental problems, et cetera, et cetera, and nation. Nationwide, 77% of people said that this was an important reason to coordinate with, to, uh, to um, normalize with Cuba. 82% in Florida, which is normal because that's the place that's closest to the island, and 80% of Hispanics. More than six in 10 also support allowing US companies to do more business in Cuba. So we asked them, we, we tested a number of other messages so allowing companies to do more business in Cuba, total support, 62%. Removing restrictions on US citizens to spend dollars in Cuba, 61%. Removing all restrictions on travel to Cuba, 61%. Allowing Cuba access to high-speed internet and other communications was interestingly lower, 52%. We think that we did this at the time in which um, the Snowden affair was all over the news, and that could be a reason. But it was interesting that this was certainly the least. And that, this, this is the total national support. If we do this, if we look at it from uh, Florida and Hispanics, allowing more companies to do business in Cuba was 63%, with Hispanics 65%, removing restrictions 63 and 67 removing travel restrictions 67 and 66 I mean, when you get into polling and you have two-thirds of a majority of people thinking something, that's a pretty sizable number. I mean, their polls don't usually give you 67, 65, 68 on pretty much on any issue. Allowing Cuba internet access here, the state of Florida was, was, uh, uh, um, was higher than the national and certainly higher than, uh, than Hispanics. So we asked two questions on um, whether Cuba belongs on the U.S. State Department's list of state-sponsored terrorism. And um, we asked, do you think that Cuba is the same as, as Iran, Syria, and Sudan, which are the four countries, Cuba, Iran, Syria, and Sudan, are the four countries on uh, the terrorism list? And 52% said no, that they were not the same. In Florida, 61% said, no, these countries are not the same thing. And Hispanics, 50%. So we then asked for those who said, for those, who, we then asked the follow-up question, which is, would you support removing Cuba from the state-sponsored list of terrorism? And nationwide, 61%, state of Florida, 67%, and Latinos, 59%. No, they said yes. They support, they support removing. Um, we then asked a series of questions that tested specific messages about Cuba. We asked, very importantly, we asked positive messages, and we also asked negative messages. The, we said we should change policy in Cuba because Cuba is only 90 miles away from the mainland. So, 58% believed that that was a good reason. That enough was a good reason to normalize. We said that our government only allows Cuban Americans to travel to Cuba. They should allow everybody to travel to Cuba, 58%. And in Florida, those numbers were 59% and 61%. And for travel, it was 59 and 60%. We said that the, U the, the Cuba trade embargo is estimated to cost the American economy, a sizable amount of money, 56% thought that there was enough reason to normalize. The Cuban government has made some important changes in Cuba, and it has freed up economic activity in Cuba, and 55% of Americans believe that that was an important reason to normalize relations. Um, in Florida, the embargo was 57, among Hispanics, 63. And the, um, n the new entrepreneurship in Cuba was 56, and among Hispanics, 64. Uh, we then asked, on the other hand, we asked some negative messages. You know, Cuba continues to have a dismal human rights record. Is that, you know, it, um, it, it uh, arbitrary arrests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
And of course, you see there that when you inject a negative message, the normalization numbers go down. Right? After more than 50 years, the US uh, has no relations with Cuba and it should have no relations with un, until the Castros re, un, uh, leave power and those, the normalization numbers goes down. We, we then asked a series, and I won't read them all to you, but I, I'll, um, we then asked a series of questions about whether you support change. Here are some messages that support change and here are some messages that don't. Latin America is the fastest growing trade partner of the United States and Cuba is part of that. 65% thought that that was convincing. The 50 years the US embargo has hurt the people of Cuba, 64% thought that that was convincing. Saying that we have good relations with Vietnam and we fought a war with Vietnam, why don't we have good relations with Cuba, 61% have thought that was convincing. As you have to engage just like we engaged in Eastern Europe as communism was falling. Shouldn't we engage in Cuba as the Castros may be falling, 57% thought that was uh, engaging. For too long, politicians have allowed Florida to control US foreign policy, 56% thought that was important. So we then asked also negative questions, right? And ending the embargo before the US, before the Cuban government meets certain democratic conditions would be a mistake, just like it would be a mistake for North Korea. 51% thought that that was a convincing argument for not ending the embargo. Or that Cuban Americans support current US policy because it puts economic pressure on the Castro regime, and putting that pressure is an important thing to maintain, uh, um, uh, to, to maintain pressure for them to democratize. 61% thought that that was a convincing message not to normalize, and that now is not the time to lift sanctions as the embargo is weakening the Castro regime. 54% thought that that was an important um, argument not to normalize. So what, I, this is the last, second to last slide that I have here. So the way the political polling works is that you try to inject positive messages and negative message and give people a sense of what the debate is sounding like. And so after they hear this, this is an 18 minute questionnaire, and so after they hear all of the positive messages, they hear the negative messages. We went back to them and again asked the question that we asked at the very beginning, which was, so should we or shouldn't we normalize? Because now they've heard the debate. We've tried to mimic the debate that they would hear, actually, if the president ever said, we need to do something to change this. So we asked the question again. And still, a solid majority of Americans continue to favor changing US policy, regardless of whether you call it normalizing or whether you call it engaging. 56% favor, 35% oppose. That was before, and now after the messages, 55 and 39. There really is no statistical change in the, um, in the support. And in Florida, um, you see it's 63% was initially, and after the messages, it was 66%. So the whole notion that Florida is this poisoned chalice that no presidential candidate can touch is just absolutely debunked. This is not true anymore, and we see it in the Florida race right now. I'm sure Guillermo will talk about this. In the Florida governor's race, we have one candidate who is absolutely for normalizing relations with Cuba, and it's probably not hurt him. Um, and among Hispanics, the initial number was 62%, and after the messages um, was 61%. So I think if you need, um, I'll, I'll stop there. If you need further proof that this embargo is not the rallying cry it used to be, that it's not the, the, the break on policy, I think this poll, and I, I think you will hear much uh, the same from my colleague, I think you will see that this is just not true anymore. And if the president would feel that it, he is interested in trying to have some type of leadership, new leadership on this issue, I just don't think that he will get a lot. There will be some people who will be very loud and very passionate, but I don't think that there will be the political damage to the president or to any future Democratic candidate that a lot of people have been threatening for so long. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excuse me. 
Our next speaker is Guillermo Gernier, um, and he's a professor of sociology at the Department of Global and Sociocultural Studies at Florida International University, the State University of Florida at Miami. Um, Dr. Gernier has written numerous books and articles on labor, migration, and um, Cuban Americans, particularly from the Miami area. Um, he's lectured nationally and internationally on his research. He started a Cuba poll in uh, 1991 and has conducted regular surveys of Cuban Americans' um, attitudes since then. And um, that New York Times uh, editorial referenced his survey as well. So um, he uh, will be talking about the results of this most recent Cuban survey of um, a survey of Cuban Americans in South Florida and look at some of the uh, indicators of change in that community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, thank you, Kate, for setting it all up. I, it's the only person that I actually <laughs> communic communicated with directly, and she did a wonderful job of getting me here. Um, I am going to be talking to you about the research that uh, we have done, at, uh, my colleagues and I have done at FIU over the last 20 years. And I hesitate to call it polling, even though it does use a methodology that pollsters will recognize as polling. But uh, I personally have been curious about the evolution, the, the devolution, the changes in the Cuban American community in Miami, specifically. Since I moved there uh, in the late 80s, I wasn't raised in Miami, I was raised somewhere else. I was raised in Georgia after coming over from Cuba, so I didn't know Miami. I laughed at Cubans in Miami, and now I am one. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't know if you actually can, I need this or not, because I'm going to be moving around, but, um, oh, okay, translation, there we go. Thank you. Um, the, the, the polling that we do is based on our research. We're trying to figure out how the Cuban American community has changed and is changing in Miami and is changing Miami. So we have done polling, as I'm going to report to you. We also do ethnographies. I just finished a, 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 a book on Little Havana. It will be published on, in a couple of, of, um, of months. I'm working on a book on Cuban American ideology. I've worked on migration in Miami. So I'm just putting this in the context that this picture here is our, our numbers associated with changes which we see happening throughout the community. If this were an outlier, I wouldn't agree to come talk to you. This is actually what you see among Cuban Americans in all of Dade County pretty accurately whether they answer our survey or not. Now, our survey has a thousand uh, respondents. Uh, we pulimos la metodología, right? We, we really worked hard on the methodology. But we have a thousand in Miami-Dade County. So we have a number that is significant even if you start cutting down into subgroups the population of the, of the, of the poll, which we, we um, we would do sometimes. The, um, I don't want to go all sociology on you here, but the, the, what we, how we analyze social change in Miami in the Cuban American community has followed a certain pattern. And what I'm presenting to you here will be a numbers in that, that follow a pattern. And the pattern is that the, the Cuban American population started moving into Miami in the 1960s, late 19, January 1st, 1959. Uh, and the population, this thing has a pointer somewhere, yeah. The population created great demographic changes in Miami. That in turn changed the culture of the Miami area very directly. That includes the norms, the ideology, the way people thought about the world uh, based on, on the changing population. Eventually, Cubans changed the social organization of the city. New groups were formed. Different groups were formed. Class, social classes began to be altered when Cubans, mostly white, began to enter classes that were predominantly white, non-Latinos. Uh, and eventually, Cubans changed the institutions of Miami and the state of Florida to some degree. Cubans had, have shaped politics, have shaped the religious organizations, everything. Now, this is a little sociological uh, overview, but what we are going to focus on now is the Cuban-American population and how they have changed Miami. Now, I would say that the Cubans, 
that came in my cohort when I was, I was a young kid, when I came over with my parents in the 60s, they've run the gamut. The population changed the culture, changed the organizations, changed the institutions. They changed everything. The Cubans that are coming since 1995, which is the number that they're making more of, the, the, the model that they're making more of now, you know, the, the old model is agotado in every sense of the word. They're, they're exhausted and they don't make them anymore, the 1960s, 1970s group. The new groups that have been coming have only gotten this far. They're changing the culture to some degree. They're not quite moving into the institutions, which is an important element of our story because when people ask, well, hey, your poll shows that the, uh, the new arrivals have different attitudes than the old arrivals, yes, they're not registered to vote. And that's like the spoiler alert. This is where we're going here with this. This is eventually the bottom line in how, the, uh, it, how attitudes become policy changing attitudes is engagement in the political process. Right now, that's not happening among, among those that have arrived after 1995. But here again, some numbers that give you, put, put it in perspective. The, uh, the decade of the 2000 to the present, in terms of migration of Cuban Americans, is the most intense migration decade of any decade. Over 300,000 Cubans have come since 2000 to the United States. Three, 300 and some thousand. Two, two slides for that. One is, uh, um, permanent resident status. You can see since 2000 to the present, the, the number that have uh, uh, achieved uh, or, or received permanent residency uh, is higher than in any other decade. Uh, and then naturalized citizens. Okay, this you've got to become a citizen. You can't play the game unless you become a citizen. Uh, this again is, here's the spike in 2008 for uh, election year spikes, which are very common. Um, and uh, so, so you can see the numbers are, are uh, growing o over the years. Now this is, that was the United States in general. That, that was the Cubans coming over to the United States as a whole. This is Miami-Dade County. This is Miami-Dade County. Now this is the entire migration stream from 19, before 1959 to the present. Here's Marielle. <laughs> That's Mariel right there, bam. Um, all right, this is, I don't, the only thing I want you to look at this is look at the, the, the redder the, 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 um, the, the, the color, the older the population, right? So here we have older populations, early migrants, younger population, late migrants, all right? So this is what we're talking about here. This is the group that's growing. This group is not growing anymore. Um, all right, so that's a, a somewhat of a big picture. Now, what's that done? Well, that's changed Miami. All those migration ways have, ch have changed Miami and what people believe to be the Cuban American experience in the United States. Miami has close to uh, two and a half million people. 35% of those are Cubans. Um, uh, 335, oops, that's a, so we lost the space there. 35% of the Cubans have come since 1994. All right, so a third of Miami, over a third of Miami right now, is post-1994, 1995 Cubans from the island. Now, I'll be glad to send, send this PowerPoint to anybody that, that, want, that wants it, okay? All right, so, so this is just to let you know that you don't have to kind of keep track of all the numbers here. Um, so anyway, this is, this is impressive for any metropolitan area, but for a young metropolitan area like Miami, you basically have, and I, I, I hate it when I say it in a way, but the Cubans are like a, the Brahmins of Miami. <laughs> I mean, my Brahmins, Cubans, uh, uh, Miami became a, a, uh, a, a city in 1896. You know, it's, Cubans have been there over almost half of the ex experience of the Miami area. So it's a sizable uh, cultural experience. Now, now we're getting into the poll now. Now remember, the younger population has come since 1990. Now this poll, wow, it, the Mac really whacked the colors here, but um, all right, I think we can tell the difference here. I'm going to go through all the questions, or the, the significant questions uh, uh, on the poll. What I, and they're all going to follow, all the slides are going to follow this pattern. The pattern is, when did you leave Cuba? And we break it down by, 50, by, by these um, um, periods. 1995 to the present is the last uh, column here. The age of the respondent 
and whether you're registered to vote or not registered to vote. Right, those are the, that's the shape that I'm putting this data, these data into for this presentation. You will notice, and I will keep, uh, and, uh, there will be a lot of numbers, and I'm not going to uh, mention the numbers, but I want you to keep an eye on this last column here, and then on this, the youngest respondents here. There will be a similarity between, or among these three columns, especially, especially 18 uh, to 29, but also sometimes 30 to 44, and the last arrivals in terms of attitudes. These are the groups that are going to be engaging uh, policy decisions, I think, at, uh, in the future. And of course, the register to vote, that's where the rubber meets the road. So you, you, you'll, you'll see that shift um, throughout. All right, let's look at that. The overall, do you think the embargo has worked well or not? Um, we know, the Cubans might be intransigent, but they're not stupid, right? I mean, we know that the embargo has not worked. Regardless of what, of what your, your political spectrum uh, of beliefs are, there's a, 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 uh, a sense that the embargo has not wor worked. Now you see here the folks that have arrived most recently, and the younger folks are the ones that are, keep, keep saying more likely than not that it has not worked well. Um, but even among registered voters, you have a 50% that, that uh, says not at all. So the embargo is not working. Now that's a warm up for the question of do you oppose to continue the US embargo. We'll, we, we didn't ask it in this order, I'm presenting it in this order. Um, we didn't ask it, you have to get some people, you have to get a running start thinking about Cuba policy before you can answer this question uh, freshly. But here you can see that it's a split. The population is split down the middle, given a 3% uh, plus or minus, 52% oppose, 48% op uh, so favor the continuation of the embargo. We ask it this way, we've asked it this way since 1991. It's the same question every year, and I'll show you the trends in a second. So registered voters, you have 51% that favor the continuation, you have 49% that are, a, this is 50-50 split that, that want the embargo taken away. It's a 50-50 split in the population. Now, not registered to vote, which are the, is overrepresented by the folks that have arrived most recently, not registered to vote, they're clearer on that. They don't, they oppose the continuation of the embargo. So the more recent arrivals are more anti-embargo than the long-standing residents of uh, Miami-Dade County. Um, all right, this is the trend. The same question asked, Varying size, we've had as many, a sample as large as 1,800. Um, I think the Christopher Reynolds funded that 1,800 sample years ago. Um, and we've had a smaller samples when, when the funding has not de uh, developed. So you can see the trend, 48% now are the, uh, are, do not continue, I mean they're not favor, favor, still favor continuing the embargo as opposed to 87% at the beginning of the uh, migration period, well, beginning of our polling, which was 1991, right before the, the, the recent migration. Unrestricted travel, new arrivals, 80%, yes. Young, young uh, uh, respondents, 90%, yes. Registered voters, 58%, yes. Unregistered, uh, un unlimited travel, unrestricted travel by all Americans. The trend on that has been on the upward side from 44% to 69% now, uh, favoring unrestricted travel. Diplomatic relations, 80% of the new arrivals. Now you can see, the, of course, the mirror image of the, old arri of the new arrivals is, is the earliest wave. You can almost see uh, these two groups kind of vying for, for a voice in the community. 88%, and again, again, not registered, uh, diplomatic relations, very high support, still over 50% among the registered voters. So you have, you're getting the picture here. There's a trend that is, can, is not, can't be denied of the new arrivals having a more um, engaging view towards the island. Polit Let's see, uh, all right. Uh, people, people travel, 65, 72, kind of split in the, in the uh, uh, less strongly favored in the registered, but still a, a large majority of folks supporting the people to people, and of course the, the not registered, which are uh, new arrivals. 
do so. Cuban American, uh, uh, the uh, Cuban Adjustment Act. What a surprise. <laughs> I'm awed and shocked. Um, the, um, there is broad support, especially among uh, new arrivals, for the maintenance of the uh, Cuban Adjustment Act. Wet foot, dry foot, again, the, the, the least support among the early arrivals, more support among the young people and the uh, later arrivals. So I could go like this, and I think I will because I have a few more slides, but you can see the pattern developing quite elegantly, as it were. Uh, now this one is what, this is like the, the surprise question, right? It's the first time we've asked this question. And it, it, uh, it basically shows that the new arrivals are less supportive of maintaining Cuba on the so-called terrorist list, um, but there's still strong support for keeping it on the list. Now, we can talk about the symbolism in this. As long as you can tell, travel to see Kitiakuka and send her medicine and all that, you might just might as well keep the pressure on the, uh, uh, the government, state-to-state -state relations. Uh, you want some pressure. So this was not as, but still you can see the difference. And I guess one of the things that I, um, I'm surprised by the consistent difference between the new arrivals and the old arrive and the early residents, early arrivals, and it, and if you live in Miami, you always hear the the old guard saying, "Hey, these new folks aren't like us," right? You always hear it, and they don't say it lovingly, you know, in many ways. Uh, but yeah, they're they're not. <laughs> the fact is, why should they? They haven't shared your specific ex historical experience. Why should they be like you? Um, all right, political elections. How important is the candidate's position on Cuba uh, for you? And we've only, only asked this of registered voters, of course. And this is kind of a lot of color here, but you can see that the, Cuba is still very important for a lot of Cuban Americans. It is uh, over 50% across all moderately important or very important. So among the young people, you have a, a, a lessening of that, but it's still 50%. Cuba is very important. Now, what does that mean? That, that means your voting might be shaped by it. Now, we don't ask whether it's, you know, you're liberal or, or conservative on this or towards Cuba. We just ask, this, is it important? And yes, Cuba is important. It has to be uh, addressed. How likely would you be to vote for a candidate who supports reestablishment of diplomatic relations with Cuba? Now, this last, uh, this is only of registered voters, right? So this last column, these two columns here are, um, signify if you have an important, if, if Cuba is important to you, how did you answer that question? Uh, almost 50% moderately important and over 50% uh, percent of very important say that yes, they would. The populate over 50% of Cuban Americans looks like would vote for a candidate support that would support reestablishment of re diplomatic relations with Cuba. Um, yes, sir. Registered, registered. These are these are questions just asked of registered voters. Replacing the embargo with an increased support for independent small business owners in Cuba. So if you, can if you can drop the embargo but still manage a way to support or, or manage a way to support small business owners, would you vote for a candidate that makes that part of his or her platform? Among the young and the new arrivals, overwhelming support for that. They didn't like the embargo to begin with, so hey, if you can support business owners while you drop that, it's a win-win for them. Um, and again, Cuba is important to them in a variety of, in, in various ways, but they're all supportive of, of that um, policy. The embargo, would you trade the embargo for increasing pressure on the Cuban government over human rights? Overwhelming, yes. Now, human rights is always a trigger question. Human rights, the first time we did, 19, in 1991, um, we did the first poll, and it showed all kinds of differences among the Cuban American population about visits and this and that. The 95%, 95 percent of the population said they wanted to support human rights groups on the island, which is, I mean, you get 95 percent, 
agreement among Cubans on anything. And um, <laughs> I don't know, you've got to kind of wipe your glasses and look again. All right, do you send money? These are a couple of, uh, of questions regarding the money, the remittances, uh, remesas. Uh, among the entire population, the circle's always the entire population. You've got 50 50, roughly. People send money and they don't send money. But you notice here the ones that have come most recently are the ones that send, are more likely to send money. The ones that have the le least send more often. And now, you forget this circle right here. Look at this column right here. Since 1995, green is over $2,000. Blue is $1,000 to $2,000. Um, so you can see the new arrivals are the ones that send the most money to the island every year. On a different analysis, which I'm not presenting here, these are the folks that are doing, they're working minimum wage jobs. They are working several minimum wage jobs. These are the ones that have the, uh, the segmented enclave is based on this, on this slide. That is, the enclave doesn't work the same for everybody. Do you think people living in the U.S. should allow, to be able to, allowed to invest? 40% yes, 60% no. New arrivals, yeah. Would you invest? <laughs> 55%, 56% among the new arrivals. So, um, yeah, if they want to, if, if this is only asked of people that's thought it, you, you should invest, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so here's where the rubber meets the road. This is where the policy meets the opinions. Right, everybody has an opinion, you know what they say about opinions. Um, are you a citizen? Only 31% of those arriving since 1995 are citizens. Other research supports this too. Um, our, our, our previous survey three, two years ago had similar numbers, a little bit lower because it was done before the election. The election kind of bumped it up. So only 31% of the new arrivals are citizens. Are you registered to vote? When they get to be citizens, they're engaged. They, they get in the game, they get in the ring, right? So the, the Democratic Party, if that's the party that uh, um, wants to soften any relations with Cuba, I think is missing an opportunity. Cubans might still have a, the new arrivals have a, the, the same kind of interest in Cuba that the Cubans in the 1980s had under Reagan, except it's not to destroy the evil empires, to create some bridges to the existing world that they've left behind. The Republican Party is losing somewhat of its hegemony, but uh, it's still the lead dog. Uh, independents, are, in, independents and Democrats, which are, is a 25 percent uh, match it, get, get close to the Republicans, but, um, but the Republicans are still mostly the game. Now, we asked this just to see, uh, I mean, this is after the fact, right? We just did this in May, right? So it's, it's uh, we were hearing all kinds of, uh, of uh, numbers up to close to 40% that Cubans, of hit, almost 50% that Cubans went for Barack Obama. All right, maybe they're throwing them under the bus, I don't know. But this is, right now, a couple of local pollsters came up with something like this when the elections were going, was, were going on, was going on. They got, and they got kind of booed down because everybody wanted to think that everybody went to them, uh, the, the, the Cuban vote was finally shifting. I don't know, but I think this is nothing else looks at their attitude towards the Democratic Party now. Um, one more. On this, a couple of fluffy questions. Is Raul better than Fidel? Uh, or not, um, would you say Raul Castro is worse or the same or somewhat better or much better than Fidel is in terms of improving the well-being of people living in Cuba? Well-being, the broad term, um, most people say it's the same. The uh, new arrivals, which probably are the ones that, uh, whose, whose testimony I would most believe are kind of split on that too. And that's all she wrote, that's it. Uh, any questions I would like to answer, I, but I, don't think she, I think she's gonna run the question. I think we're going to have questions for, for both our speakers. So um, you had a question? Um, I'm 
I'm curious, um, on the new arrivals, the arrivals since uh, 1995, you said that 31% was registered to vote. Citizens, 31% are citizens. Okay, citizens. Um, obviously, they've had time to, uh, to become citizens for the most part. Do you have any idea, do you have any research that explains why only, this? Only apocryphal. I mean, I have hit the streets and I've asked people. And the, um, the, the answers are very, very broad. Number one is that they, they want to wait. They just want to wait. There's something maybe that they want to go back. That right now they have, a, because of the Cuban Adjustment Act, they have a pretty good situation. They can work. And they can send money back and can travel back and forth. Um, um, you're, you're on, that's kind of a logical answer. Sometimes you hear things like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to become a citizen because then I'll get called for jury duty <laughs> and I'll miss work and, you know, I can't miss work. You have a spectrum, but no, the I, bottom line is I really don't know. I have a question about your research. Um, you mentioned that, you know, you've got the people broken down for when they came to, to the U.S. Do you also have people who were born here? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I knew somebody would ask that question. <laughs> yes. The, the problem with, with, we haven't reported it. We didn't report it. And it's because our, we, ha, we did 700 cell phones and 200 some landlines trying to get the younger voter. And one of the most telling and, and uh, kind of, uh, there are no numbers on this, but we barely missed getting a representative sample of the Cuban Americans, mm -hmm. so we didn't. We're not reporting it because we're low on those numbers. I mean, we I can pull them out. Cuban and, Americans, and they're all significant. People I mean, born here, I mean. Cuban born here. Yeah, Cubans born here. We, we've always reported, mm -hmm. but we've seen over the years, as a matter of fact, a declining interest among Cubans born here. At least in answering our poll. I mean, I don't know. Maybe all things Cubans are still wonderful, frijoles negros, and all that. But in terms of answering our poll, we've noticed that decline. Um, over the, the, the years, and this year we just went under what we consider to be a, a representative number to report on its own after you break it down, so we didn't report it. We, but they're, they're captured in that 18 to, in that, that young yeah. group. Do you think it's because um, they're less likely to consider themselves Cuban or, you know, because no, you, they, you we screen an, they for... answer yes. They answer Cuban. They, they just don't finish the survey. They oh, don't, they don't complete it. They don't complete it. They don't, they they don't, don't care go, about uh, it anymore. I mean, that's one way Maybe. of looking at it. It's not as relevant to them. And we go, I mean, we did almost 800 uh, cell lines, you know, out of the thousand. Mm -hmm. so, oh. so, and we noticed that. We don't, we've been watching, we've been graphing it over the it years. There's a, there's a re reduced interest among I was just curious. Um, yes. Thank you. This has been terrifically fascinating. Uh, I am interested in a couple of things you didn't touch upon, and, and they are the correlation between the change in opinion and political donations uh, from this community, uh, campaign contributions, candidates, Republican, Democrat, the amount, um, as well as the issue of the change in public opinion and, and the kind of political tenor of the major, major TV and radio shows, the media outlets the opinion makers in, 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 in Florida, uh, whether there's any correlation there. I'm wondering, uh, in addition, if the two of you were, uh, I, I'm wondering if you could actually apply this research as advisors to Hillary Clinton's campaign uh, <laughs> and tell us from, from what you've gathered here, it, how, what has been said to her such that she has now preemptively come out uh, and said, you know, the embargo doesn't work. It's not working for our interests. The Cubans use it as an excuse, according to her, and so uh, we, should, we should lift it so they don't have any more excuses. In other words, she is already in advance uh, staking out a position, which is quite interesting, and obviously having looked at uh, the very data that you've presented to us. I'm glad to take the last question, and, and you can take you can you well, can take the one about 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 contributions, about contributions from Miami. I don't I'm, I'm not I'm not sure I can answer that. The the um, you know I think as I said I think any political candidate today is going to be told that the Cuban issue doesn't have the juice that it used to have. I mean it just doesn't, and um, which means you can liberate a political candidate to basically say do what you want. And my sense is that Hillary Clinton, ever cautious, is doing what we in the political world, 
I guess I shouldn't say we, I'm no longer in the political world. What, what the political world would say is inoculating herself, right? And so she's basically saying it clearly hasn't worked. It clearly is a crutch to the Castro administration. Um, it's the everlasting excuse. It's the excuse that keeps on giving. It provides them with all the answers to any of the problems that they may have. Um, and, but it, on the other hand, she doesn't go quite as far as to say, given the fact that it's been a crutch and given the fact that it doesn't work, therefore I believe we should take, we should not, um, we should take it down, or I will advocate when I'm president to take it down. I, she hasn't said that yet. I don't know if she will say that. But I'm certain that um, she has taken this position this far because her advisors have told you there's really not going to be a lot of consequence to taking the position that far. Yeah, but I, you know, I, in addition to that, I think that Clinton, when she was in a position of power, also mentioned that she thought the embargo should be lifted. And the fact that it, it wasn't, and I think that, I mean, ultimately, there's Cuba, and there's what people think about Cuba. And I think Cuba is just not important enough in the global scale for anybody to go and cash any amazing, any political chips. It's just, so yes, she could do it. I, I, I think that certainly the data are supporting any kind of, as if data were like the guiding light, uh, it's not the guiding force in any of the Cuban, uh, it's passion that guides Cuban, or grudges. It, a lot of decision, a lot of emotion guides Cuba policy, but not data. Um, and I think that, that there is a sense that now you have a chance to realize that if you're going to pander to the Cuban community, be sure you realize what community you're pandering to, because there's a, a variety of communities up there. And I think that if you get more new Americans, uh, new Cubans involved in the, America, in the process, um, you're, the backlash is, is going to be minimal. The Cuban vote is not as important as it used to be, if you're looking at it that way. It's purely that way. It's not as important as it used to be. It's not as monolithic as it used to be. Um, and when you, we ask them if Cuba is important, yes, Cuba is important, but it could be Cuba policy is important for the new arrivals in a different way that Cuba policy is important for the earlier arrivals. And the reality is, I think, that the, the conservative Republican, the people who would be upset about changing the, the rules on Cuba, wouldn't have voted for her anyway. Yeah. I, I would just add that the Cuban population is also a small, uh, sm, sm, uh, decreasing in size compared to the larger Hispanic population in general. I mean, it's just, no, it used to be when you said Hispanics in Florida, you basically basically were saying Cubans, and to, that's every day less true. And as you saw, Hispanics in, in my poll, um, they generally are very, very pro-normalization. Which is also why um, President Obama won Hispanic, the right. Hispanic vote in Florida for the first time, a Democrat won the Hispanic vote in Florida for the first time. Yeah. Well, Chris is the canary in the, in the cage right now on this. We'll see. Right, right. I, I have a question around here. Mm -hmm. um, I came from Florida, so I, I think I need to insist in... Uh, it's a question for Peter, actually, about this political damage. Because as Grenier shows, like the, yes, the newcomers are changing their minds, but still they're not citizens, they're not mobilized. So do you think that there's not a... This, there's not going to be a political damage uh, for a uh, Democrat candidate or... Because even in this Chris and Scott race, Chris already has back, back off and say that he's not going to Cuba. And also Joe Garcia and uh, David Curbelo's race, uh, Garcia is insisting that he's pro-embargo. Like, there's a no-go zone there, you know, about Cuba. So do you think like in Florida and uh, there's not going to be a political damage for a candidate to change Look, its I, I, policy? Florida is the most important political state in the nation. N not, not the second or third most important. It is the most important because the, uh, California is going to be Democratic for the next 20 years, and Texas is going to be Republican at least for the next 10 years. And so Florida is where it all happens. And I think Florida has grown tremendously, and the proportion of importance of Miami-Dade and Broward compared to the population has declined. I'm not saying it's not important, it just 
less important than it used to be. So I think from all perspectives, you have more Hispanics that have, you have more Hispanics now in Florida that are not Cubans. You have other parts of Florida that have grown tremendously over the last. Do, do you have the, data about the political mobilization of these all other Hispanic groups, like the Puerto Ricans, how much they vote, are they citizens? Not, not, in, that, not in that level of specificity, okay. no, because in, in my poll we couldn't get to who is Puerto Rican, who is Nicaraguan, or who is, no. no. So that will help, you know, to. Um, I have, uh, can I? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, sometimes when you hear a message, you try to shoot the messenger. And um, I remember when these polls were announced and publicized uh, that there was uh, a good amount of criticism of the polls. Um, and so what I'd like to hear from you guys is, what were the most common criticisms of the polls or of the methodology of the polls? And what is your kind of rebuttal or response to that? Because I remember that back when these came out in the spring, that took up uh, a news cycle, at least in terms of the Cuba issue, and I'm interested to hear how you would respond to some of the criticisms and what those criticisms were, was. Thank you. Sure. Um, let, let me just say a um, personal word first. The, the, um, my view of Cuba, I, I find Cuba to be an important thing, important issue, but it's to me, and to my center, it's an important issue for what it means to relations between the United States and the rest of Latin America. In, in itself, Cuba is certainly a, 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 an issue that merits a lot of conversation, but there are two huge in structural impediments to an improvement of relations between the United States and Latin America. One is called immigration, and the other one is called Cuba. And we, we are, for example, I'm sure you'll talk about it in the next coming days, we're, for example, facing a very interesting, quote unquote, diplomatic deadline, which the United States seems to be moving towards agreeing to going to the summit of the Americas next April, um, even though Latin America's leaders have basically said to, said to President Obama in the last summit of the Americas in uh, Cartagena, he basically said, listen, the next one, the Cubans are coming. You don't want to come? Don't come but they're coming. Um, and so that's the case. The Cubans have been invited and the Cubans are going to go. And so it's now up to the United States to make a final decision. The State Department has hinted that, that, uh, um, that the U US is gonna go even if President Raul Castro is there. So for me, the issue has always, the, what has motivated me has been the issue of what Cuba means for the rest of Latin America. So I thought it was massively funny that when people who have never met me, have never known me, have never seen me, couldn't pick me out of a lineup, you know, called me a Castro hugger <laughs> and um, because of this poll. Um, so, you know, the, I, I, I couldn't pick them out of a lineup. So um, I have not spent 30 years of my professional life advocating for or against Cuba. I've spent 30 years of my professional life about Latin America. That's what motivates me. So, um, so I found the accusations to be amu amusing. What the principal accusations against the poll were, not against me, but against the poll were, um, was that um, a number of uh, people who represented sort of the advocacy groups around the uh, anti-normalization uh, issue called this a push poll. And the reason they called it a push poll is because we tested messages. I have spent 25 years in doing polling all over the world in presidential campaigns, in uh, issue advocacy campaigns, and what one does is one tests messages. Now it's very important to test negative messages to see if the negative messages work as well or better or worse than the, than the positive messages. I showed you in the poll that we did test positive messages. What were the best messages that would convince people that one should normalize? But also, what were the best messages to convince people that we shouldn't normalize? But then we went back and asked at the end of the poll, as I showed you, having heard all of this debate, where do you come out? And they came out exactly in the same place that they came out at the beginning of the poll. The Floridians came out higher, having heard all of this debate. So um, the, the accusation was the push polling. 
uh, message testing is what we do in polling. If the polling is about not taking just a photograph, but actually trying to predict and motivate how policy can be changed, um, you test messages, and you, but it's important that you test messages honestly. Try the best ones for and try the best ones against. Yeah, and on, on this poll, um, let, me, let me say that when we started doing this in 1990, we, we've always gotten attacked. We always get attacked. Um, I'd be offended if we didn't get attacked. Uh, the, but we get attacked for different things. It depends on the position of power that, that, or threat that the folks that feel, that, that feel attacked <laughs> by the poll. Uh, are willing to muster. In 1991, we were being attacked because it was the first poll that showed there was a diversity of, of opinions within the Cuban American community, and and folks really came down on us on that. And and um, and then since then, there have been other polls. So on this one specifically, the attacks were. I must admit that they. I've seen better. <laughs> these were pretty lame attacks. I've seen better attacks in the previous years. The um, there were two major attacks. One was that it was on the methodology. They, nobody disputed, and, and I would I said to actually to folks that attacked me, and, and Lincoln, Lincoln Disbalart went on MSNBC and very strongly called this a push poll, <laughs> and I wrote Lincoln and say, hey, you had no problem with my polling when I had questions about you in the poll, <laughs> which I did. I used to many times I would ask about Lincoln in the poll, and he was very happy because he, he was considered to be a good leader. Um, so it's, uh, and he didn't mention me by name because he knows better, he knows that I would never do a push poll. Number one, I've been doing it for 20 years, so what, and the same questions. But the principal uh, complaints were that there was no undecided um, choice in the embargo, right? Oh, in the question. In the question. And to that, I mean, I, the, this is not a political poll. The topic is political. This is research that I try to do to understand the political attitudes and the shifting nature of the Cuban American population where I live in Miami. Um, number one, so I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm interested in people that have opinions about the embargo. Now, that on the one hand, theoretic, uh, in, in research terms. Um, in more personal terms, you know, there might be a Cuban out there that doesn't have an opinion about the embargo, but I think he or she would be too embarrassed to say she doesn't have an opinion about the embargo. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I, 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 I'm interested in folks that have opinions about the embargo. We didn't have, a, it's not a political poll, it's not an undecided, hey, I'm gonna vote for Chris or Scott, I'm undecided, no. Tell me what you think about the embargo. Now you cannot answer, you know. You know, they, they cannot, and, they, and, and, and if you were to include the not in answers, you would have a lower percentage, you'd have a still a split population, they'd just be split in the high 40s, right, if you include the no answers, right. The other one was, um, again, we over, it, 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 was, it was this, is that in the, in the question that we asked the, um, the respondent, if he or she's a citizen, they give us a response. In my first presentation, public presentation of, of this information, the next question that we asked only of folks that were citizens was, are you registered to vote, right? In my first public presentation, I didn't have mm -hmm. that little disclaimer up there that said, only, ans only asked of citizens. I assume people would know that I wouldn't be asking folks that weren't citizens that were registered to vote. You know, like my initial joke was, hey, we're, we're not living in Hialeah here. Because <laughs> I has a terrible reputation of you know dead people voting. Right? Uh, so uh, no offense to Hialeah, it's, a, it's just a, you know, it's a joke. It's a joke. But, um, it's a nice place. But the point was that oh you know you're right. You know I, how would I have guessed that you would not you would think that I would ask this of people that weren't citizens? So then I stuck the disclaimer up there. I, you know nobody really knows right now, but I, I, I we do have a question about um, visits from the island and whether uh, we have whether more people have come, fewer people have come, they've stayed longer, and we, I, I don't report those data, but um, it seems like you are having more frequent visitors, uh, even in this new wave of, of, of um, soon after the, the change in policy, and that they're staying for longer, and that 
but we don't know. We don't know. I'm trying to work with a colleague on the island to see if we can do a, an analysis of how the, of the impact of, of this new migration policy. But the, I was in a conference not long ago, or a, a discussion not long ago, where somebody, actually it was, it was uh, Peter's uh, presentation of the book in, uh, in, in, in Miami, where we talked about the, I think it was the, the, the impact of the new, of, of these folks who are, that are coming from the island and they can kind of get to see if they really want to come here. You know, if they really want to come to the United States because as we say in Cuban, muchos se cachan, you know, when they, when they arrive. I mean, some folks want to go back and so I think this is allowing for folks to feel the waters out and that's the sense that we get from this first asking of these questions that I haven't reported, but we're getting a sense that folks are coming over and staying with, with relatives to find out what's going on. We have a question here. Um, so what interests me about this is, you know, you see those shifting opinions in Miami, you see those shifting opinions in the United States, um, but I think the issue is that the people who are elected into office who represent the Cuban-American community, um, Ileana ross Layton, the diaz Bullards, I mean, the list, um, yeah. you know, uh, is there, we know it. Those are the people who are, um, have an outsized role in shaping policy because they have actually gotten into very strong positions of power. So what ultimately does it matter what people shifting opinions are if the, yeah, the, that would be my question. <laughs> yeah, I think you've answered it. It doesn't, <laughs> opinions are, uh, you know, like other parts of one's body, we all have one. And um, I think that you're absolutely right. I think it has to do with, with what does it matter what people think if you keep electing people that don't express your your views, and I think that the the only way we're going to answer that is to get these 31, this number 31 percent citizens up from the new arrivals and and get them registered to vote because you're and that's what Ileana said when they interviewed her by the way the, uh, about the poll that got her at the airport and uh, she said oh, I'm not even going to look at it because hey I'm getting elected and reelected and those are the people that I really you know they know where I stand on this and they keep electing me you know you cannot argue with that. Really? So can I take a slightly different view, which is, but I want to tell you a funny story first, which is I did, I presented my poll in Chicago to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and David Axelrod was kind enough to sort of moderate the, the session, and um, he began by saying, look, I'm not talking about anybody in particular, but it, for politicians in general, all my clients' polls are like crack cocaine, right? They're addicted to them, right? The problem is that when politicians become policymakers, when they win, and they're no longer just politicians, they actually have to take other things into consideration. So it's an important factor to, that they have. But suddenly, for example, for my client, President Obama, you know, this poll is imp may be important, but suddenly he has to also take into consideration that sort of Bob Menendez is the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, and he's got you know, 61 ambassadors stuck in that committee. He's got to fight with them on Iran. He's got to fight. Do you want another fight, right? So, you know, and I think David really described that well in a funny way, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I think there is no doubt that um, there is a level of passion and emotion when it comes to Cuba and the representatives that are elected from Florida and Senator Menendez. Um, so they bring with them a sense of enormous commitment that the people who are answering in my poll, and I would even dare to say a lot of the people that are answering in Guillermo's poll just don't have, right? And so that level of, that level of emotion and intensity is not there. However, they, we are talking about a relatively small number of people. And, um, that you know, I I would say, are increasingly not in line with what everybody's thinking. That they're outliers. I mean, increasingly they are not mainstream, but increasingly people are thinking that these that this level of emotion on an issue which so clearly has failed. I mean, we're, you know, we are talking about 50 years of failure. I mean, if if government change has been the the objective of this policy, it is a failure. I mean, the same two, two dudes are there for the last 56 years. So I, I think increasingly people are seeing them as outliers. 
<laughs> if, I, if I can add just a, a little bit to that, um, a lot, and it has to do with also identity of Cuban Americans in Miami. I think the Republican Party has a very strong hold on a large part of the population. That it's that that if they vote, they vote Republican unless they're engaged, unless there's a pat, there's a reason that they uh, that their interest in Cuba is not. It, it overrides the Republican position. And I've run across this in a variety of ways, and one of them is it, during the Occupy movement, when the Occupy movement was happening and all the cities were mobilizing, Miami mobilized as well, and you had a lot of Occupy, occupied activity in Miami. And I went out and I interviewed the, uh, the people involved in the Occupy movement in Miami and, and the marches and all that. And I did uh, a couple of hundred of, of by hand, quick and dirty, one-page surveys about why you're, you were there. And you'd get a very, uh, if I was, would, I would say a class-conscious almost response to why they were there. Well, you, you expect it. It's a self-selected sample. Nobody's forcing people to go out in the streets. So they go out, and they all talk about you know unemployment and how the parents lost their jobs, and it's very uh, 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 unequal society and to rich to fail, they had the wrap down. And the Cubans, uh, uh, and at the last question, the last question I had is, are you registered, are you, what party you're in, are you registered to vote? And these very class conscious kind of revolutionary Cubans, they were Republican. Uh, uh, you asked them at the last question is, oh, well, you know, are you registered to vote? Yes, what party? I'm Republican, I'm Republican. But they were out there. Uh, and whereas most of the others, African Americans and non-Cubans were Democrats in, in the same street. So I think that very often people go to vote and they, and they end up engaging the Republican rhetoric, even on Cuba, even because they, they, they're Republican as an identity, as a Cuban American identity. And the Cuban American identity as a Republican is, is very, very, very strong. You had a question? Here. Yes, Guillermo, on the question relating to the terrorism list, were the respondents informed prior to being asked the questions about the re possible reduction, if Cuba was removed, of restrictions on banking, transactions, commercial relations, as well as travel, so that they made a more informed decision? No, that would have made it a push-pull. Uh, <laughs> um, I didn't, though. I mean, I didn't. That, that question was, was crafted well, I thought, but it was pure information. It was straight up information as to the nature, what it did, what what the, um, um, you can get all the surveys, by the way, on the C Cuban Research Institute uh, websites at, 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 FI, at FIU. Uh, but no, we didn't, we didn't say, it, it, um, and I'm sure that if I had, if I had asked, and this is, you know, something that I might consider next time. I would still ask the question straight up. But if you, in, in Florida, we're particularly affected by, the academics in Florida are particularly affected by this, uh, being, by Cuba being on, the, on this list because there is a, a law that's called the Rivera Law that prevents us in Florida from using any um, foundation funds that are brought into the state coffers to do research on Cuba. So if I, when I go to Cuba, I have to pay it out of my own pocket. It doesn't matter if the Reynolds Foundation wants to give me money to go. I can't use that money if they go through, at least an example, um, if it comes to FIU directly. We can't, because of the Rivera Law. And that's because it's on the list. So if I were to want to soften that response, I would probably do something like that. Say, do you know that if, if taking it off the list, this would happen? And would you still want them on the list? But it, there would, the guarantee would be a change, but that I think would be kind of push fully. <laughs> the last question? Well, actually, <clears throat> that really was my question, um, the terrorism list, and I was struck by the numbers there compared to most of the other questions, and it was a very similar reaction, which was my understanding is for a lot of those other things to happen, a first step would be lifting the terrorist de de designation, so it seemed a little bit skewed. Well, most people don't know that, and we didn't inform them of that. We didn't educate them as, as we asked them the question, right? Which is what I think my, the definition of my push poll would be for me. <laughs> well, I want to thank our panelists.
Guillermo and Peter. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you for all your time. Thank you, Marjorie.